Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas B. Miras. Today I'm talking to Dominican friar Father John Maria Devaney about the past 150 years of Dominican ministry in Manhattan. Hey, everybody. The Dominican Order is undergoing a real renewal and a huge boom in vocations, at least in the eastern province. And I've been blessed to get to know the Dominicans here in New York City through my parish of St. Vincent Ferrer on the Upper East Side. And as it happens, the Dominicans just celebrated the 150th anniversary jubilee of their ministry in New York City. It's quite a fascinating and multifaceted history. Uh, So I wanted to have a real expert on the history of Dominicans in New York City on, and that is Father John Maria Devaney. I actually didn't do a lot of talking in this interview. It's a topic that, well, I find very interesting, I know very little about. So I really just wanted to let Father John talk, and he sort of leads the discussion since he knows the history uh, so much better than I do. So this episode is almost more of a talk by him on the general history of the order in New York with a sort of Q&A by me at the end. There's just so much great history here, and I especially enjoyed the parts about Rose Hawthorne, who some of you may have heard of, daughter of Nathaniel Hawthorne, who ended up founding a community of Dominican sisters to care for poor cancer sufferers. Father John actually used to be a blues disc jockey, and he still hosts a weekly radio show for the Dominicans, so he's a really great talker. And I think you're going to enjoy. As always, you can find show notes, links, and timestamps for this episode at catholicculture.org slash episode six. All right, here goes. Enjoy. Hi, Father John. Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, asking me to be on with you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background? Sure. Uh, I'm 42 years old. I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I was ordained about three years ago, right around now. And I grew up in New Jersey. And I discerned my call to the priesthood during, I really say right around the death of Pope St. John Paul II. And I felt called to religious life. So I ordered the, I entered, excuse me, the Dominican order, uh, the order of preachers as it's known, uh, the sons of St. Dominic. And uh, now I've been living as a friar for almost 10 years. I entered in 2008. And currently I'm serving here in the Archdiocese of New York as a hospital chaplain primarily, the Dominican Friars, we have a um, kind of a, a hospital apostolate we call the Dominican Friars Healthcare Ministry of New York. And the Friars, as we'll get to talk to a little bit more, or we'll find out a, bit, a little bit more during this podcast, uh, we've had a long standing history in New York. So I've joined the ranks of uh, many Friars who've come before me in care of the sick and the dying through our hospital work. And also, too, uh, before I entered the order, I had a background in broadcasting. I worked in public radio for 15 years, from California to Boston, New Jersey. So uh, I also host on satellite radio. Maybe some of the listeners of this podcast might be familiar with Sirius XM satellite radio. I host one hour a week a show called The uh, Word to Life on the Catholic Channel. I did not know that. Yeah. So, And the Friars have had that show for 11 years now. So I've been the host of it for almost four. Great, great. So uh, the Dominican fathers here in New York just celebrated a jubilee of 150 years serving in the Upper East Side, and my own parish of St. Vincent Ferrer just celebrated 100 years since the building of the physical church, which is, I guess, renowned across the country in terms of church architecture. It's certainly one of the things that, that drew me to this parish. So we'll be talking about both of those things throughout this podcast. But could you just tell us, start from the beginning of the the very beginning of the Dominican ministry here in Manhattan? Sure, absolutely. It is 150 years. Uh, It was June 22nd, 1867. The bishop then of New York, his name was uh, Cardinal McCluskey. And I believe he was the first cardinal of New York. And he gave the official welcome to the Dominicans. But it really goes back a a step further. 
it really goes back to about 1866. So one thing that's been part of the Dominican charism, especially for the last 150 years in this country, uh, but also it goes back to the very start of the Dominican order. We're known as the order of preachers. So Dominicans are known to be good homilists and good preachers. That's what St. Dominic wanted. That's our charism. And there were these things called parish missions. And parish missions have a long history in the United States, but it's good old-fashioned preaching. But they used to be more in-depth. They'd go on for a couple of weeks. And what a parish mission is when a priest or a preacher visits a Catholic parish and has particular topics they preach on or particular aspects. Usually it's catechetical. It's also, uh, you know, just it's like a shot in the arm uh, of preaching and, and pastors will invite them in. So in 1866, our province of St. Joseph dedicated six friars to preach parish missions exclusively. That's all they do is preach. Uh, They wouldn't be chaplains. They wouldn't be pastors. They wouldn't be professors. They would just hit the road like a band. And we actually called it that, uh, a a preaching band. And the band lasted for almost a century. After the Second Vatican Council and due to a number of changes in parish and parochial life, uh, less Catholics going to church. Believe it or not, there were great social events in the evening, so people would want to come out to hear the preacher but see each other. And n- competition, frankly, TVs, VCRs, you name it. So parish missions don't have the impact that they used to have, but they're still going on. So in 1866, we set aside a group of friars to do just this work. And they were based out of Louisville, Kentucky, And what we did was they booked their first mission here in New York in Chinatown at a place called Church of the Transfiguration, which was a Protestant church, but it actually uh, had been given over to the Catholics. And it wasn't Chinatown back then. It was basically just Irish or whatever immigrants were. It's Chinatown now, and the church still stands. And actually, it's neat because it serves the Chinese-speaking, I believe, Mandarin-speaking Catholic population of New York. And the friars were such a huge success that... The diocese or the archdiocese in New York at the time wanted to invite the friars to set up a permanent home in the city. So fast forward one year, 1867, we're invited and we officially get the permission by Bishop McCluskey at the time to set up what we now have today, which is the Priory of St. Vincent Ferrer. Uh, We'll get into this a little more later, too, about the apostolate and what we do now. So June 22nd, 1867, we officially began. Now, on the Upper East Side at that time, the Upper East Side now, for most people, is known almost as the Beverly Hills of New York. It is is quite a wealthy neighborhood. It's changed drastically in the last 50 years. It's actually gone up. Many places often go down. This place has gone up, at least in economic standards. And when we arrived here 150 years ago, it was called Shantytown because the west side of Manhattan had been already developed. The west side just was plotted out. It was easier to build on. It was flatter. The east side of Manhattan had rocks and hills and little – that's why it's, it's quite hilly. You don't realize it, but it is actually quite hilly on the east side. And not like San Francisco hilly, but you know, uh, there, there were just pigs and goats and chickens. So the first church, which was under the – The patronage of St. Vincent Ferrer, one of the greatest preachers of the Dominican order, maybe even one of the greatest preachers of the Catholic Church uh, after in the history of the church after uh, the apostles, was that it it became known and it was basically a school. It was like it looked like a one room schoolhouse almost, if I could give you a visual. And that was uh, we had that church ready by September of 1867. And we'll get into this a little more, but the current church just celebrated its 100th anniversary, the actual physical church of St. Vincent Fair. Now, also, too, now, and that's kind of more of our modern apostolate, we have a second church. So it's the Church of St. Catherine of Siena. They were two separate parishes, and they had a merge under the major mergers that happened in the Archdiocese in New York in 2015. But uh, we can get into that more, too. I know there's sure, a lot of things we sure, have, sure, we're going to sure. settle in for a while. Yeah. So we can talk about how the, the more that developed. Yeah. All right. So we're officially invited in and we're established in 1867. At that time, it's very important. Think about it. It's about maybe a year after uh, the Civil War has ended. So reconstruction is happening in the South. And really for Catholic New York and for New York in general, here we are in the Upper East Side, the 60s, but the city really didn't go above as far as the concentration of population, uh, maybe 
maybe 34th Street at the highest. So this was quite rural up here, even on the west side as well. And then if you went further up where Harlem is now and above Central Park, that was very rural. There was nothing up there. Who knew that it would, you know, the city would just build itself right out to the end, to the tip of the island. And at that time, the church in New York was growing tremendously because our massive waves of immigration from Europe really began to crash on the American shores after war, after the Civil War. Now, interestingly enough, the Germans had been coming here a while. German Catholics uh, had been coming to New York for quite some time. They started coming over in the 1840s, 1850s. There were some Irish, but the real waves of Irish immigration began in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, the Italians started coming over like the 1890s, a little later after the Irish. And then, of course, there would be many more. There would be Slovak-speaking immigrants. There would be Polish. Would But the Irish were really, you know, the most, the biggest group. And so what happened was that the Upper East Side was home to thousands upon thousands of Irish families, Irish immigrant families. And where we sit now today, uh, Third Avenue had an elevated train. And of course, that wouldn't come till a little later, but really from Third Avenue to the East River. And technically, just to give people a little geographic layout, we are the next parish up from St. Patrick's Cathedral. Because the cathedral is a parish as well for those who live in the area, even though it's a cathedral. So, St. Vincent Fair, was the, the Dominicans were the next stop up on this side now, uh, actually, that we are on the east side. And so you'd have these five-story row homes that would have long hallways. The term is shotgun-style apartments, where it'd be a long hallway that's small, but it would have off to the left and to the right, or usually to one side or the other, depending upon how the building was laid out, rooms. And then people used to have big families back then. So you'd have six kids, eight kids, born to mother and father who were from Ireland. And then they would raise the kids. And of course, people had the church here as not just the place to worship and the faith they brought from Ireland over here, but also a place of social connecting, you know, whether it's education, evening dances, different men's organizations like the Holy Name Society or the Altar Rosary Societies. So a lot of different apostolates within parish life that would make it quite social in addition to worship. That's changed a little bit in New York now too. It's quite different than suburban worship. In New York, people kind of tend to come into the church, pray, light a candle, go. You know, It's not like we have parking lots in suburbia where people hang out and have the kids run around and there's a fish fry, you know. We have elements of that. But what the suburbs have, just I know I'm going on a little bit of a digression here, that what the suburbs don't have that the city churches do is people who just come in randomly. So it's real important to New York churches. They're always open, New York Catholic churches. That's how I discovered this church. I used to work in the neighborhood. And as you said, you were drawn to the architecture. And we'll talk about the architecture in a little while. I was drawn to the beautiful architecture as well. It's gorgeous. So in New York churches, thousands literally of people a day, whether they're Catholic or not, or nominal or Jewish even, or whatever. I mean, I've met these people. They come in, they light candles, and they pray. Because the architecture of, of most churches in New York City is gorgeous. Uh, it was built by the immigrants, you know. And so that you don't get in the burbs. You got to pull up your car. You, maybe it's opened, maybe it's not. So that's one thing the city has that, I, in my opinion, the burbs doesn't have. Even though there's people, oh, I drive on my way home and I pull, but it's more intentional versus maybe here it's a little more impromptu movements of the spirit in people's hearts, you know. And also too, dare I say, outside of Rome or maybe the Holy Land, where else is the Blessed Sacrament more concentrated per square block than New York City. You know, there's churches every 10 feet in Rome, and I've never been to the Holy Land, but I imagine there's, you know, several, several just churches of all kinds of devotion. But after that, I don't think there's too many places in the world that that have churches which in which within such close proximity of one another. Yeah, you know? it's really easy to get to mass if you if you live in New York or it confession. Is. 
It's almost like mass every hour, you know. So that's one of the blessings, uh, just to give the listeners a little um, insight into uh, worship in the city. But going back, so the Irish start arriving, and we then build a second church. Of course, obviously, within a year or so, the little schoolhouse-style church is too small. So we built a Gothic-style church. I think it was built in maybe, I think, within 10 years at the most. By the 1870s, it was built. And then the Irish just keep coming. They keep coming. Then, of course, at this time, too, the Irish are starting to build up their power and influence in New York City. The, maybe many people remember from their uh, you know, seventh, eighth grade or first senior history classes, uh, Tammany Hall and Boss Tweed. And so the Irish were also coming, becoming influential in politics. And, of course, their numbers were so big in the labors and the unions, things like that. So we were all part of that. And... Very quickly, we had a school open up for children, a sister's congregation called the Dominican Sisters of St. Mary of the Springs. They came from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, they sent sisters here, and the sisters lived in a, in a brownstone or, you know, uh, the, nowadays we equate brownstones with fancy, wealthy, you know, uh, one family and five floors, you know, with the, that kind of what you picture as your head. But back then, these were very practical homes, and again, it was one family per floor almost, like I mentioned earlier, but the sisters came and they began to teach the students. So the school was established very quickly. The friars were up and running with their parochial ministry. Also, too, our province were called the province of St. Joseph. The Dominican friars had, had set up our headquarters here. So geographically, our po- province's boundaries at that time, we went all the way out to like Chicago and down to Texas. Yeah, we had a big geographic responsibility. And then in 1850, there was basically the Western province or the California province. So at that time, there were only really two Dominican provinces in the U.S. So what decade is this when the sisters arrived? Well, the sisters would arrive pretty quickly. So by the end of the 1860s, within within three or four years, they were here. And there's actually a couple of cool stories about sisters' congregations. We'll get into those in a little while. That sprang from this place we're still going today. But then... Now, currently, there's four Dominican provinces in the U.S. We're like the eastern province. We're basically out to Ohio and Kentucky, down to Virginia, up to uh, New England, and everything in between. And then there's like a southern province, central province, western province of Dominicans. So here we are. It's after the Civil War. Again, the Irish are, are arriving. The parish is growing. Then the sisters arrive to open the school. And then, interestingly enough, there's a need to care for and and help the immigrants because these people are poor. They don't have a lot of money. And a few very wonderful holy women uh, moved by the Holy Spirit began apostolates. They began outreaches. So forgive me, I, I wish I had remembered the two sisters' names, but there were two English sisters from England. I don't know if they were converts to Catholicism or if they were, or they were English Catholics, they had come here under the care of the friars and they began doing good works about two sisters and then they attracted a few more women. These are women in their late 20s maybe where they were feeding the poor, they were going to people's homes, they were finding out sick families or fathers had left. So they were they were working with families and think about how this podcast is dedicated to the Holy Family. So I mean – we have our modern difficulties with the families, but even back then, you know, it's not that things were always rosy. You know, there was abandoned parents or there was drugs or alcohol, probably more alcohol than, than hard drugs that we see nowadays, or parents who didn't teach their children in the faith. So I think many of the problems, they don't just escape our time, even though maybe maybe they're more intense in our times due to the state of the family. But so these two sisters blood sisters began to work and began to become under the care of the friars. And they ended up starting what we now call the Spark Hill Dominican Sisters. And those sisters, and still do, but obviously not to the numbers they did at their peak, taught in schools all around the greater New York area. So that was just one of about seven or eight Dominican congregations of sisters. So and there'll be a few of those we can get into who did different good works that were started by women who came in contact with the friars or were appealed to the charism of the Dominicans. And 
Uh, they started from the very steps of this parish and they would help the poor in the neighborhood. And now here they are still going over 150 years. And the Spark Hill Dominican Sisters, they're based out of Spark Hill, New York now. And they got that name because they moved out to the country by like the 1900s. And they had a mother house and they still do up there. Are these the same sisters who teach at the the girls' high school at St. Vincent Ferrer? No, Fair? actually they're not. The current sisters who teach at the girls' high school – they are a group called the Dominican Sisters of St. Mary of the Springs Bridgeport. So they were with St. Mary of the Springs, that original foundation going back to the beginning. Because you're right, there currently is a girls' high school where the grammar school was. It stopped being a grammar school maybe 30 years ago. And it was a, it was a combo grammar and high school. But it became a high school in the 50s, 1950s. And then it stopped being a grammar school, high school combo and we switched over to an all-girls school, about 500 students now, about 20, 30, eh, 30 years ago, maybe in the 1980s. And the sisters who teach there currently, and they actually have their convent, and there's a funny story about that when we talk about the, the new current physical church. They are an offshoot and now an independent entity sponsored by the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, for uh, St. Mary of the Springs. So they, they took that name of the original foundation, but now it's under the care of the Bishop of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're still in the 1860s. Correct. Yeah. Is this the time of uh, Bishop Dagger Hughes? Or <gasps> Oh, yeah. He, so he's, no, this is actually uh, after him. John Hughes, fam- this is a neat little slice of uh, a New York bishop history. And actually, we can, we can dive into this a little bit. So his name was John Hughes, and he was a diocesan priest. Uh, He actually grew up, I just found this out last week, grew up in the Emmitsburg, Maryland area. Oh, really? And so he actually was taught as a young child by St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Wow. Yeah, uh, because that's where she started her schooling, the first Catholic school in the United States. And that's where I learned about him was at my high school of Seton High School in Virginia. All right, very good. So he would end up coming uh, to study at the seminary, Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg. Then he would obviously serve as a priest. And then he was asked to be an assistant of the current bishop of New York at the time was the name of Bishop Dubois. He was a Frenchman. And there were French Catholics here, but not to the degree the Irish were. So he never really got along with the Irish too much. But it was funny, he was asked to be the secretary, the assistant to Bishop Dubois. So he comes to New York, and Bishop Dubois and also John Hughes had a prior history at the seminary down in Emmitsburg where they didn't get along too well. So here they are now in the same house in New York, uh, called by God to grow in charity you know, with <laughs> each other. And then uh, Dubois, interestingly enough, at this time we have old St. Patrick's. And and actually, there is a, a pre-slice of Dominican history that now is worth bringing up that I didn't bring up. So the Dominican order started officially in the United States in 1805 with a guy by the name of uh, Edward Dominic Fenwick. He was from a wealthy and educated Catholic Maryland family from the colonial period. Also, too, by the way, just on a side note, I guess this is a little bit of a plug, but if you want to get a peek into pre-immigrant Catholicism and what Catholics were like I mean, we're all immigrants here, but what Catholics were like before what we think of now with the Irish, the Italians, the Polish, the immigrants, the poor. There's a great book out by Father Charles Connor, who is uh, on EWTN. He does host The Church in Time. He also is a teacher, uh, a Catholic history professor, and he teaches a few other subjects at Mount St. Mary Simmonsburg, at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland, currently. And he has a book on Catholicism in the 13 Colonies that just came out. Well, that sounds fascinating. It is. So it really, these Catholic families, which this is why I bring this up, they were allowed to practice their faith. They were landowners. Maybe they were slave owners. Uh, who knows? But they they were, you know, they were part of the fabric of the colony. They were very small in number. I mean, very small. But they were allowed to function and they weren't looked down as like second class, you know. But he covers that more in his book. So anyway, Edward Dominic Fenwick goes to Europe. French Revolution breaks out uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. He is an American. So he's in Louvain, famous uh, seminary over there in Brussels, uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, I always get it all confused. Netherlands, Brussels, <laughs> uh, uh, the Dutch, because it's anyway, we'll leave that to the, the people who've been there. He uh, came back and he wanted to open a theology. He, so he didn't get bothered by the French. The French 
they sent him home, whereas other Dominicans were imprisoned. And I mean, the, you know, the French Revolution was awful in the Catholic Church. And so they sent him home and he wants to start the Dominican Order of the United States. He gets permission to do so. Now he goes to John Carroll, fish, first bishop of the United States at that time. And John Carroll had said to him, uh, he wanted to start a school, a theology school in Maryland. But he said, listen, we have Georgetown. There's no need. So we were sent out west to Ohio and Kentucky, the Dominican Order, to be basically horseback priests. So a lot of the early, the Catholic, that was the frontier at the time. So the Catholics were out on the frontiers who we took care of, all the way from uh, the peninsula of Michigan, all the way down to uh, uh, down to Tennessee, you know. And a lot of the first bishops of those cities out there were Dominican friars. And we didn't really come east till Washington was 1854. That was our first settlement almost 50 years after we were founded. So there was also another prehistory too, which kind of actually connects New York and St. Elizabeth Ann Seton because she entered the Catholic Church here in New York. There were 13 Dominican Irish missionaries who worked basically from D.C. up to maybe Boston, helping out the parishes and the young fledgling church in the late colonial period under John Carroll. They were not officially part of our province. They were just missionaries. You know, there were Dominicans who were sent and they helped John Carroll out. There was a difficult Franciscan who was currently, there was only one church at the time in Manhattan, Catholic Church, St. Peter's on Barclay Street, still there today, right in the shadow of uh, Ground Zero, 9-11, you know. This Franciscan friar had to be replaced. So, even though he was in Baltimore, he was in charge of New York. John Carroll sent this Dominican missionary to be the pastor there. And it also coincides with the time that St. Elizabeth Ann Seton entered into the Catholic Church. So it's most probable that it was a Dominican friar who gave her instruction entering into the Catholic Church. Now, it gets even a little more interesting. This is probably this, we could have had this a little earlier, the prehistory. The Archdiocese of the Diocese at the time of New York, 1808 in the United States, four dioceses were founded. Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and believe it or not, Bardstown, Kentucky. And you think, what's <laughs> okay. the mecca of the cultural mecca? At that time, they thought Bardstown was going to be like the St. Louis, the gateway to the West. Of course, it, it didn't become that. But all those were the first, after Washington and, and Baltimore and, and the foundation of them, yeah, it's funny to you, you chuckle as you did about Bardstown. But uh, that being said, the first two bishops of New York – were both Dominican friars. Now, it gets more interesting. The first bishop, there were Irish friars, was from a priory called San Clemente in Rome. That's right in the shadow of the Colosseum. The Irish friars have been there for several centuries. It goes back to where the fourth pope, St. Clement, who was probably ordained by St. Peter on that very site, had a home several stories down, and Catholics have been praying there in the shadow of the Colosseum for 2,000 years. I mean, it's really great. So he was chosen to be the first bishop of New York, but he had to go through Na Naples, and there was a naval blockade by Napoleon. So he died in Naples. He never made it to New York. The first bishop of New York never made it to New York. His name was Luke Concanon. And he was a Dominican friar, and he was an Irishman. And he had been the prior of San Clemente in Rome. And when you go there now in Rome, the Dominicans are still there. There is a plaque that was put up by Terence Cardinal Cook, who was the Bishop of New York in the late 70s and early 80s. He put up a plaque thanking and dedicating Luke Concan and the guy who never made it. Now, the second bishop then, his replacement, was another Dominican Irish friar. I don't know if he was out of Rome or where he was from exactly. I mean, Ireland originally, but his name was uh, John Connolly. And he was the second bishop of New York. He did make it. He's now buried down at Old St. Patrick's, and he cared for the, the early days of uh, – so in a way, he was almost the first bishop of New York. Right. So forgive me. I know I probably could have given you no, those roots fascinating. before the, the preaching ban of the 1860s. So, so anyway, more sisters' congregations. If we kind of jump back into the late 1890s now and almost the turn of the century, you know, the Gilded Age is happening. So you've got – J.P. Morgan Chase, you've got the Rockefellers, you've got all these big tycoons building their huge mansions on Fifth Avenue, just a few blocks from where you and I are recording tonight uh, for this podcast. And here are the friars and the poor Irish just a few blocks over to the east to the river. So we would end up building in 1881 Priory of St. Vincent Fair, which we're in now. 
And it's a gilded age building. Uh, so it's very large, made of brick. Not many buildings from this period still. That's the thing in New York. You build something, then you rip it down. That's that's what New York is. It's constantly being up, ripped up and torn down. So the friars, we've lived continuously now in our priory. That's what friars live in, the priory. Franciscans live in a friary, but Dominicans live in a priory. <laughs> I, I don't know why we're not. We're all friars, you know, but but uh, I mean, the tradition is- I our, think it should begin with a D, you know. Yeah. A, 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 a dryery. A dryery, yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> but it, we're Catholics, we drink, so it would be a dryery. You know? Exactly. Um, but we also call our leader a, fry, a prior, you know, we elect okay. a prior. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, I know we've kind of jumped all over the map just to kind of get back on track here, but it, you know, it's the story of the friars taking care of the immigrants really as we hit. But uh, so New York's getting more wealthy, Upper East Side's growing, and we're we're seeing the need now to open another parish. So it's the 1890s, and we open up a mission church over on uh, 68th Street between First Avenue and, New and York Avenue called St. Catherine of Siena. Now, this time, the neighborhood's getting a little bit of a Italian population. The Irish are still holding strong. And there was actually a joke, too, I should have said this earlier, that our province, the province of St. Joseph, I should have been called the Irish province because there were just so many Irish, you know. If you look back at all the names of the deceased friars, and even to this day, I mean, it's just all Irish. We'd occasionally get an Italian last name or a Polish last name or somebody from Eastern Europe, but maybe German, but we were all Irish friars mostly, or Irish American, excuse me, descent. So 1897 hits and we open up St. Catherine of Siena. It's a mission church. And there's a real cool story about a future saint in the Catholic church and her work. I'll get into that in a moment, uh, right around this time. So one of the friars, first pastor of St. Catherine of Siena Mission Church, was a friar by the name of Father Clement Tinti. He was out of this house. He was originally from Iowa or something, but he lived at the priory of St. Vincent Ferrer here. But they asked him to be the first pastor. So there's a growing need for just another church. There's thousands and thousands of Catholic families. And also with this little budding pocket of Italians, I think they named it after Catherine of Siena because of, you know, she was an Italian saint. Just uh, if I can ask a Please. quick question. Yeah. When you describe something as a mission church, maybe it seems obvious, but because this is already an established location with Catholics in it, what exactly would distinguish a mission church? That's a good question. So it's almost more of a canonical law feature almost. So... A mission church would be like a satellite parish of, uh, or satellite location of a current parish. So, case in point, that church was called the Church of St. Catherine of Siena, the physical building. It's not the, there's a new one there since the 1930s. So, as a mission, it's usually much smaller, but there's a need. And distance wise, even though you think, oh, couldn't the Catholics just have walked over a couple of blocks and a couple of avenues, you know? But the Catholic population was so strong, and there was this need for the Italian immigrants, because we had an Italian mass over there. There was one Italian friar sign there that mission churches, and they're still in places, they have a Catholic community. And of course, it's important to that local Catholic community to stay there, to be there. These are the people who work in the neighborhood, live in the neighborhood, all those things. So quite often, we'll still see mission churches in rural areas in the United States, even in some suburban areas, especially with mergers now. So... You might not have the sacraments celebrated there every day, but at least on Sundays, a priest comes out and visits. So that's that's what it started as. Um, but then eventually it grew enough within just a few years to be its own parish. So it became an independent autonomous parish, the parish of St. Catherine of Siena. Then in 1916, I'm jumping ahead a little bit where we are on our, our timeline, it became its own priory of friars. So it's called the St. Catherine of Siena Priory. So to this day, we still have an independent priory over on just a few blocks from here. And then we have this priory as well. Now, also in modern New York history of the Dominican Friars, we're down at St. Joe's in Greenwich Village now, serving the Catholic uh, population there and at New York University. But that we could talk about later. So you were talking about the very beginnings of St. Catherine yes. as a mission church. So Father Clement Tinti, 
He also started what was called the first Catholic settlement house. Now, settlement houses in New York with the immigrants were places where they could go and they could get classes, language lessons, material support, help, camaraderie, games, things for children, really just like big clubhouses for the neighborhood serving tons of needs. And the Protestants were very good at starting these and and maintaining these settlement homes and uh, where people could come. And Father Tinty, God bless him, said, you know what, we're losing Catholics to Protestants because they're offering all this material aid. So we need a Catholic settlement house to keep our own. And sure enough, he started the first Catholic settlement house in New York, just a few blocks over from St. Catherine of Siena's. I don't know how long it lasted. I don't have a lot of details on it, but it was founded and it was named after St. Rose of Lima. And she uh, she was the patroness of welcoming uh, these immigrants. And Father Tinti started this as an outreach of St. Catherine of Siena. But it gets interesting. So at the time, there's a famous book called How the Other Half Lives. It was written by a journalist and photographer by the name of Jacob Rees, R-I-I-S, I think is how you spell his last name. And it's a classic book on the plight of the immigrant poor in the tenements of the Lower East Side uh, in New York, where they were in squalor, they were in filth, they were packed in 30 to a room, you know, because this is all they had, you know. And cancer has been with us for millennia. And cancer at that time, the care is nothing like obviously we have today. And it was quite hideous often. It was disfiguring. So there were many poor people in these tenements. Oh, it was also thought to be contagious. So they would get cancer and then they would be kind of put out on the street or there was a place called Ward's Island where they would be almost quarantined, you know. But we know now that cancer is not contagious, you know. So... It was a woman. She was very, comes from a famous line. Her name was Rose Hawthorne, the daughter of Nathaniel. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a fascinating part of her story. She will be, God willing, she's well on her way to uh, being a canonized saint from the Archdiocese in New York. So her cause is currently open for canonization. Uh, it was opened by Cardinal Egan, uh, rest his soul, ten over 10 years ago. So, but just to give you the backstory, so she is the daughter of Nathaniel. She's Protestant, marries her husband. They have a little boy. They actually, excuse me, I take that back. They both became Catholics together. And, you know, it's not that often you had famous people becoming Catholic. So it caused quite a hubbub because she was in literary circles and societies and she was, you know, she was part of the in crowd. Was if you that will. just because of her father or did she write as well? Oh, she did write. She wrote as well. But of course, I think her father's heritage had a lot to do with that. Yeah. But no, she did write. That's a good question. She becomes Catholic. Her husband comes Catholic and they end up having a very difficult marriage. They have a little boy, dies at five years old. Her husband had a problem with alcohol. They end up separating. He ends up dying, her husband, sadly. And then, so here she is now in this, this, by God's providence, she's got this money. She's got a big home down by Water Street, near where Wall Street is today. And she sees the plight of these poor immigrants with cancer and their wounds and their holes in their faces and all these things. And she begins to let them into her home. And she begins to take her money and treat them like kings and queens, the best linens, the best bandages, the best food she could get and acquire. And there was another woman who joined her. Uh, Her name was Rose Hubert or Hibbert, I think. And they began to care for these poor out of her home. And these poor with cancer would stay with them till they died. And then she meets Father Tinti, the first pastor of St. Catherine Siena. And she would walk up to the Priory of St. Vincent Fair, where we're currently having this podcast from, and she would walk up the steps and she would sit in the parlor, which we have today still, and talk with Father Tinti about how could she organize and do this more as an official apostolate of the church here in New York. And he suggested that she start a group of sisters. And so they did as lay women. And the bishop at the time of New York was uh, Michael Corrigan. Uh, Michael Augustus Corrigan. He's buried in St. Patrick's now. On a quick side note about Michael Augustus Corrigan, during his time, there was such, we're talking like 1890s, early 1900s now, there was such waves of immigration of all kind. 
that every two weeks he was opening either a new church or a new school in the Archdiocese of New York. It is absolutely incredible. No other bishop of New York or cardinal now of New York has come close to that kind of growth, even though now we're at 2.5 million Catholics in the Archdiocese of New York. And geographically, we're from the tip of Staten Island to almost Sullivan, Ulster, you know, up by Woodstock, about two hours north. To drive the diocese without traffic would probably be about three hours from start to finish. So that being said, Father Tinti, Father Clement, influences her and suggests, why don't you take on the Dominican charism? Why don't you start a group of women? So they call themselves the servants of the suffering, or the servants of relief with those suffering with cancer or something like that. I forget what they were called at the time. And if you go to the archives in the Archdiocese of New York, there are letters to Bishop Corrigan saying, I would like to formally start this group of women. There were about three or four others she joined in, and they were all running out of her house, don't forget now. And they would take no money. That was the other thing, too. They would take no money for their services. To this day, the sisters still take no money, no insurance even. They'd take anybody, Catholic or not. And so did Rose. She did the same thing. So she ended up... And she said she was under the care of the Dominican friars here at St. Vincent Fair, and uh, that she would like to take the Dominican charism on for, and the Dominican order for her servants, I mean, for her sisters, formally. And so they were granted permission through the bishop, then eventually, I guess, through Rome. And they are now known as the Dominican sisters of the congregation of St. Rose of Lima. And they're up in Hawthorne, New York. Their common nickname is the Hawthorne Dominicans. And they're famous uh, for their care of those with cancer. So her religious name would become Mother Mary Alfonso after she professed religious life and and took vows. And of course, she could do this because her husband was dead, her child was dead. And really now, it's it's not, I think, give it time, but she can be called probably the the patroness of, of all hospice workers. They don't call it a hospice. The sisters strictly call it a home for the cancerous poor. Because once you're admitted to them with six months left to live and stopping all treatment, they've had people who rallied, went into remission, lived with them for five, six, eight years, even more. And once you're in, you're in. You're a, re- you're a guest. You're, not, you're a resident. You're not a patient. They don't even use those terms, you know. And um, they take no money. And to this day, the doors have stayed open by God's providence and the generosity of good Catholic men and women and beyond. I've spent many a a time up with the sister and even a summer I had up there. And their charism is just phenomenal. And uh, their care, I think, just on a side note, she will become the patroness. So right now she's servant of God. Next step is venerable. They're examining all the writings and all her journals and all her works and all the paperwork about her. That's currently in Rome. We need two miracles. So if anybody listening, uh, you never know how God will use this podcast, uh, has friends with cancer or they themselves are suffering with cancer, begin to pray to Rose Hawthorne uh, for a miracle. Because, you know, I'd love to see one of the miracles come out of the Archdiocese of New York naturally or miraculously, excuse me. I mean, if it happens, you know, somewhere in Taipei because we've got someone listening to this podcast, that's great. But it's interesting too, when you're praying to a saint for praying to a person in heaven whose cause is open for canonization for a miracle, you can only pray to them and you can only pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. So you do, you can't say, well, all right, my A team might be this particular woman, Rose Hawthorne, <laughs> but I got a B team and I got right. a C team. No, right, it's right. got to be her and her alone. That's you know? cool. Yeah. But St. Joseph's always allowed and, and Mary's always allowed for intercession as well. But Rose, this is interesting too, because the friars now, this kind of gets into more and more modern history, but there's a world of renowned medical centers, which we are the chaplains to now, which I kind of mentioned at the beginning. St. Catherine of Siena as a church was there way before the hospitals were. The hospitals have only been there about 80 years. We've been there 120, 130 in that part of town, in addition to the 150 of being here in New York uh, on the east side. So Rose got some of her early training as a nurse. She did take a little bit of study for about six months, how to care for cancer patients as a nurse at what was called Memorial Hospital or New York Cancer Hospital. That would go on to become the famous, world famous now that the Dominican friars have always had the custody and care of the Catholics, 
Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer wow. Center. Wow. Yeah. So I'm Where you also said hoping- mass earlier today. Yes. Yes, exactly. I did offer mass there earlier today. And we have a mass there on Sundays and we visit Catholics for 80 years now at that hospital. Many a, a soul has been saved by God's grace and, and mercy through the hands of the friars there. And I'm honored to be in that, that tradition, that patrimony that's been passed on. Um, it's like no other place in our province. We don't we don't have and there's very few places in the United States where a male religious community has such responsibility and care of so many hospitals. We also serve the hospital for special surgery, which is a famous orthopedic hospital, a lot of hips and knees that go. And then also uh, New York Presbyterian Cornell, NYP Cornell Hospital. They're uh, big for all types of disciplines, a lot of car- cardiac, but they have pediatrics as well. And uh, so we care for all three hospitals because they just sprang up in the neighborhood around us. And it was always Dominican Friars who were going to serve them. So that being said, uh, my deepest hope really is that one of the miracles for her cause would come out of Sloan Kettering. So if there's a miraculous cure of a cancer patient and the doctors cannot explain it mirac- uh, I mean, naturally or medically, then how cool would it be for one of the most famous cancer centers in the world to have a miracle for a woman who trained there and now is going to be a canonized Catholic saint, yeah, yeah, that, Rose Hawthorne from New York. So we've begun to a little more aggressively promote her story and her cause with the patients and their families. We have to do a better job of it, but we're just getting it rolling. And it's my hope and delight. And if it happens in our lifetime, I'll tell you why this. we should pray for this. We know that the assisted physician suicide movement, you know, that's called death with dignity, and it's just the opposite, is spreading throughout the country. You know, in man, modern man's desire to control everything, now we even want to control our own death. And unfortunately, there are about five states, including the District of Columbia, that have now legalized physicians to write prescriptions that will lethally kill these people who have six months less, they're supposed to be of clear mind, who want to end suffering by their own hand. And, you know, it is suicide no matter how you call it. And in, in, a, in a way, if these people of, are of clear mind and heart, Perhaps it's more even grave than someone who's suffering from schizophrenia or paranoid or mental illness truly and commits suicide. Suicide's always sad, no matter what. And we have to entrust people who commit suicide. If you read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, we entrust them to God's mercy. We don't say they're in hell because we don't know. We don't know what happens in those last moments of life. But we pray for them, you know, and the Lord knows where they are and what their heart was at that moment of death or how they were given the grace to reach out. But that being said, I think her canonization would be the antithesis to physician-assisted suicide to say, you are important. Your suffering never goes in vain. We will treat you and care for you and give you palliative care. That's what they call it now, you know, and the term hospice is used, although the sisters don't like to call it, they call it a home, not a hospice like I mentioned earlier. So I'm, you know, for the listeners, even if you're not connected with Rose Hawthorne, but to pray that she'll become canonized, the sooner the better, you know, and the fact that she will become the the role model, Catholic role model of how we seek care at the end of life. And her sisters are still active in Atlanta, Philadelphia, and also New York, in Hawthorne, New York now, the town named after actually her father. So Rose Hawthorne's story is a real gem in the crown of the history of the Dominican Order in the Archdiocese of New York. And also, too, to share this with the listeners, it was very fascinating because from 1866 and those parish missions we talked about a while ago at the beginning of the podcast – up until 1916, the eve of World War I, the Dominican nuns, which we have cloistered nuns, were tucked away praying like Carmelite nuns, like St. Teresa the Little Flower, or like uh, Benedictine nuns in a, in a monastery. The Dominican nuns, which St. Dominic started before he started the friars, he organized women in the south of France to pray for his preaching efforts. So we have Dominican monasteries throughout the world. Hunts Point in the Bronx, again, that was rural. The Dominican Monastery was started by Archbishop Corrigan in 1889, and uh, the nuns are still there. They they can look out on the island of Manhattan, and since 1889, they've seen every single skyscraper go up, and even the Twin Towers fall down, and they prayed for the city of New York, hidden, tucked away as you know monastic nuns. And then also during that time, we talked about the friars establishing, but also during that 50 years, 
the sisters' congregations, Spark Hill Dominicans. There was also the Dominican Sisters of the Sick Poor, Rose Hawthorne's Dominicans. So all these women banded together to do the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. So really in that 50-year period, the order flourished and blossomed in the Archdiocese of New York, uh, really even finishing with the Mary Knoll missionaries that are up in Mary Knoll, New York. Uh, they were started, they took the charism of St. Dominic, the sister who founded them, the Dominican sisters of Mary Knoll and the Mary Knoll fathers, and they brought the gospel to the East. You know, they went to China and they went to Asia. Unfortunately, it's been difficult with their work ever since the communists came in. But so really there's this great, you know, 50 year period where the order completely, utterly exploded in the Archdiocese of New York while the Catholic population was exploding as well. Uh, so we could move to kind of like more of the architectural period now, what, what's kind of come, you know, after World War I. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah, no, no, I know I've been going on for a while here now, and I know we're, uh, we, we we're almost at an hour, actually, with a couple of hiccups. But if, if we looked then kind of now to, you know, here we are, it's World War I, and from maybe about World War I up until Vietnam for the next 50 years, maybe 1916 up into the late 60s, you know, the, obviously World War II, the stock market crash, the Roaring Twenties, the Depression. So it's basically just your meat and potatoes Catholic life. In 1918, actually 1916, the Dominican friars decide to build a new church here on the site. So the second church obviously is standing and the friars contract one of the best known church architects in the United States at that time. Because don't forget, there's strength in numbers and there's money in numbers. So all of these poor Irish families that were in the thousands, they, you had a lot of nickels and dimes and $5 bills up from families yeah, that can grow to the hundreds of thousands, you know, pretty quickly for the time. So they banded together and there were a few wealthy patrons as well, wealthy donors, wealthy benefactors. And they built this gorgeous church. The guy's name was Bertrand Goodhue. He built St. Thomas Episcopal Church on Fifth Avenue, which is like the premier Episcopal Church in the United States, one of them. And he contracted by the friars to work very closely to build the current church of St. Vincent Ferrer. It's in Gothic style, English Gothic to be exact. It's probably the finest example of English Gothic architecture in the United States. It's renowned. It has a full set, which is very rare in churches with stained glass that you get one set from of that period of one artist and it, they're called conic windows conic was a, a peer or colleague of um uh, lewis tiffany comfort we think of T uh, tiffany stained glass you know the tiffany lamps and conic windows were famous at the time and the whole church is done in conic windows my oldest brother who is a philosopher and used to teach at he taught at hunter college for just one year and he used to come here and he he remembers the the Aristotle window. Correct. Uh, could you tell us about that? And yeah, how no, that came absolutely. To be? That, that's great. Aristotle so, with a green halo. Yeah. So the Dominican patronage, uh, obviously, there's great saints like Catherine of Siena, Vincent Ferrer, Thomas Aquinas. But in one of the windows, there is a stained glass memorial. Of course, there's plenty of saints, you know, but there is a picture in stained glass of Aristotle. Now, Aristotle is very important to Catholic theology because here's some Greek pagan philosopher, but many aspects of Aristotle's philosophy, because what's philosophy? It's the study of wonder. It's the goodness of our human intellect and our mind, reason, matched with the beauty of faith. We think of the great document Pope John Paul II put out, Fides Horatio. We believe in faith and reason because if you have just faith, then you can be fundamental. And if there's no reason, but then if you're just reason, well, then you become either atheist, pagan or secular, you know, and, and you, we just explain everything away. You need both. God has given us both. So many of the great writings of Aristotle, especially his natural cosmology or his philosophy, his ethics, his metaphysics, meaning like after the physical world, his thoughts about what we don't see, things unseen, he had those incorporated they were translated into Latin at the time, actually through Spain in the medieval period when the Dominican order was first getting going. And it was St. Thomas Aquinas and many of the other early Dominican friars and the church at large who ended up taking many aspects of this good, wise, true philosophy and incorporated it into Catholic theology and Catholic dogma. So case in point, 
transubstantiation, big word, but it's believing that when we see bread and wine and what tastes like bread and wine, but is actually from the Last Supper and our Lord instituted the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of him very self, we took Aristotelian philosophical principles on something's substance and accidents. Now, that could be a podcast for another time, but that it really, Thomas Aquinas took this to explain it, that something can change in substance, so it's no longer bread and wine, but the accidents, the the window dressing, if you will, the taste, the smell, the color, even the alcohol contents of the priest has to be careful how much he pours before he consecrates, that all remains, but yet it's trans, it's changed in substance. So, the friars in the debt of gratitude to Aristotle and the Catholic Church and the Dominican Order put Aristotle in the window next to St. Albert the Great, who is the teacher of uh, Thomas Aquinas and a great Dominican philosopher and theologian. And And St. Albert had a similar range and broad scope of study to Aristotle in terms of his interest in natural science. And there's stories about him hanging off of a cliff ledge to observe eagles mating habits and things like that. Oh, yeah. And and basically building like the first greenhouse in the world and growing roses in the winter, you know, things like that. And then also in that window is St. John the Evangelist too. But this church is so unique and so beautiful. It now sits at the corner of 66th Street and Lexington Avenue where the second church was built. Ever, I've been coming into the church 10 years now, almost 12, and no joke, every week I see something I did not see before. There's that much detail. And th- the architecture, Bertrand Goodhue said that it was his finest work, and he worked so closely with the friars. They spared no expense for the glory of God, and we just celebrated now in the month of May 2015, 2018, May 5th, 1918, the the final you know, stone was placed and we opened the church on May 5th, which is the feast of St. Vincent Fair in the Dominican order. His feast on the Roman calendar is April 5th, but we got permission to celebrate in May because there were so many years where Vincent Fair got bumped off because of Lenten or Easter celebrations. Yeah. So the current church of St. Vincent Fair now sits at a hundred years. Now it took time to get the windows in. All the windows didn't come in until almost World War II. Things have been added to it, even taken away a little bit uh, over the years. And basically, you know, the Catholic Church just kept on keeping on through the 20s, 30s, 40s. But when the 50s and early 60s started hitting, this neighbor ha- this neighborhood had white flight, if I could use the term. Not because all of a sudden it got dangerous or got, you know, burnt out and bombed out or, you know, drugs or become seedy like so many other parts of the city did, like the South Bronx or places, um, other parts of Manhattan. Basically, people just moved out to the suburbs. And then the era of the high-rise apartment of the early 1960s, even the late 50s, there's a famous one, Manhattan House, where a couple of, just up the block from us, all of those old brownstones, uh, townhomes got destroyed, wrecking balls, the families got smaller, and this neighborhood became very wealthy. So the demographic has changed a lot in the last 50 years from being these big Irish families with a sprinkle of other immigrants to now, since the council, the parish is much smaller. There's less families. Families are smaller now. We know that. Also for a multitude of reasons we should do another podcast on. And now it's more international because the UN is not far from here. And so the waves of Filipino immigrants, they had deep devotion to St. Vincent Fair in the Philippines, so they've naturally been attracted here. So we have a large Filipino contingent. You mentioned the talking about the 50s and the 60s. I just recently heard that Andy Warhol used to come to the church regularly for mass. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, there there is a legendary story. So Andy Warhol, the famous American pop artist who, you know, basically places like the, there'd be no museum of modern art without a guy going in his innovation and style. He was from the Pittsburgh area, uh, raised Ruthenian Catholic, uh, which is one of the Eastern rites, I believe. Like we have the... Um, Maronite Catholics, and there's 26 Eastern Catholic churches that are united to Rome, but have held on to many of their traditions and uh, weren't affected by the Great Western Schism when the Orthodox started in 1084. And Andy would come here, and there's still one of our brothers who is alive, because Andy died, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s, and maybe he died, I want to say like 86 or 89, he died. So maybe almost 30 years ago now, um, I might be wrong on that. But so he was a practicing Catholic 
Now, of course, he was known for being part of uh, the New York nightlife culture, the modern art movement. Also, too, this was public knowledge that he was a homosexual. And he, though, kept his faith. And he also, you know, I, I don't know all the details, but it's believed, uh, it's been written about that he tried to live out the virtues of, of chastity and purity to a degree. So he also c- would continue to come to Mass. And I imagine that he was just brought in like many of us are, including myself, and you said at the very beginning of, of this podcast, is by the beauty of the church. And there is one brother, he's been here since 1981, his name is Brother Damien, he's not a f- priest, he's a brother, but he's you know been in the order 60 years now, and he's in his late 70s, and he's been the sacristan here, and he confirmed it. He would say that Andy would come in, it was interesting though, he said he would come in at the end of one mass, when the liturgy of the Eucharist would be beginning, then he would sit in one special area of the church, and he would stay through the liturgy of the word of the next mass. So now maybe he went to full masses as well. Maybe he bopped in and out to pray. But he said that's one of the habits he had. Maybe it was to avoid people, um, you know, that he didn't want to, you know, talk. And, you know, he wanted to just take time to be with the Lord. Also, interestingly enough, I encountered a guy who was part of either his bodyguard or security guard or driver or something like that. He used to be a New York cop who said, yeah, indeed, he would bring him here and he would come here to St. Vincent's with Andy. And then after he died, interestingly enough, two things happened. They found a whole bunch of interpretations of the Last Supper that Andy had in his collection that the people didn't know about. And then also, this is very little, this is very unknown, but there is a fund with his estate that is specifically for artists who want to paint in the classic style, the humanist style. So here he is with crushed soda cans and modern art, and yet he... I imagine deep in his heart knew the importance of carrying on the styles that the greatest works of art in the world have been made in, you know, and to the glory of God. So, you know, obviously I can't comment too much about, you know, his struggles and his day in, day out, and, you know, leave that to the other people. But to see that here's a guy who maybe if he had lived in a different era in our more modern times, just even the last 30 years, maybe would have been ostracized or criticized for trying to keep his faith and be part of the circles he was in. So, yeah, well, well, hopefully maybe more will come out about this story as the years go on and before everybody's dead who knew, you know, the full truth on stuff. Yeah, I think yeah. that kind of duality was more tolerated back then. You know, I was just thinking of Jack Kerouac the other day and how he, you know, certainly didn't live a very Catholic life, but he considered himself a Catholic his whole life. That's right. I think he had a brother, a priest. And it's probably that Kerouac died with the sacraments too, you know? You know, especially in the famous circles now of of art and culture and music and and entertainment and celebrity and what we all follow. You know, yeah, you you can't be both and, you know, part of that and and also be a person of faith. It's very, there's, there was more difficult to be that way, I think, you know, yeah. Or it's um, or you have to be one or the other. You have to fully accept that religion, if we can call it that for a moment, or you can't accept it at all. You know, with its yeah. doctrines, dogmas, and practices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an earlier era when you know Catholicism was just more part of the the public sphere as well. As I mean, pra- as as religion was as well too. Yeah. You know, I I was uh, in San Francisco last November. And I went to this place called Coit Tower. And uh, on the inside of the tower, there's these murals. And they're all kind of like, depending on the era of the mural, some of it is sort of like New Deal propaganda and and other stuff is more like socialist, you know, stuff and different things. And But there's a painting of people in a library and you've got the author's names written along the spines of many of the books and you've got you know, Wilde, Proust, and Geed, and then you've got Maritan, you know, in there. And I thought, oh, so that was from the era when, when Maritan was still, you know, a lot of secular artists were reading Maritan and being yeah. influenced by his thinking. Yeah. So. No, just like a lot of people read uh, Seven Story Mountain, Thomas Merton, that was a bestseller among many people, you know, not, I had a musician friend of mine, couldn't believe he's not Catholic. He said, oh yeah, I read Seven Story Mountain. I'm like, wow, you read Seven Story Mountain, you know, yeah. But that is true. And, and you know, I think, you know, here we are now, we've, we've covered 150 years in, you know, roughly uh, an hour and 10 minutes or so, a little less. 
you know, the big question now is, as we celebrate 150th, oh, one new expansion for the Friars too was 10 years ago, we were given the Parish of St. Joseph's, as I'd mentioned, the, and the university campus ministry we got in 1989 for New York University, which believe it or not, statistically would be the biggest Catholic university in the United States. Now, I say that by demographics. So I think New York University is like 50,000 students, and I think maybe 48% are Catholic. Uh, forgive me, but it, but heavily, heavily Catholic. So we have the NYU Student Center right at at, at Washington Square Park South. Yeah, There's a yeah, gorgeous new chapel. Cement. The priest offers mass, and he looks over at that little arc over across the park, and he looks north. He doesn't face east, but he looks north. So you know, and then of course with the colorful West Village population, to be now the custodians uh, and the and the care of souls for St. Joe's down the West Village is a great honor. And I think we're still kind of settling in down there. I mean, you know, it's 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 still new for us. It's only been a decade and and it's a much different city down there, believe it or not. It's one of the fascinating things about New York. You get out of the subway and you're in a different world, you know, even though it's all New York. I think the big thing now for the Dominican order that we've been blessed with vocations and many men entering, I met the order here in New York. And of course, New York is, you know, it's the capital of the world. And there's so much here from arts and entertainment to finance, politics, how will God use us now in the future of a growing secular city and its influence on the greater culture and society at large? Right, yeah. Meanwhile, still caring for the immigrant and caring for the sick and do the things we've done since the day we got here. That's the big question. One, I want to tell you the thing that really made me decide to make St. Vincent my parish, and that is the Fatima Shrine, actually. Oh, wow. So, what I had been, I think I had stepped into the church before, but the first time I came to Mass here was my friend Matt Kirby, I think, uh, who works for the Dominican Foundation. I think Correct. he was involved he, he in organizing this. He's not getting paid for this podcast, no endorsements. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think he was involved in setting this up somehow, but basically... Well, you you could tell more of the history of it. Yeah, actually, you know, there's a, there's really actually a very important thing. I know we're going a little longer than we originally scripted, but if that's okay with you and the listeners, we're on a roll, and I'm getting a third win now. So, uh, no, this is very important. So, right now, currently, we have the church, we have the priory. You know, we talked about the church from 100 years ago. We talked about the priory being from the Gilded Age. There's the girls' high school, which was built, you know, from the original foundation of the school. But there's also a building we built in the Art Deco period in the 1930s, and it's called the Holy Name Building. And I'll see how this, I'll explain how this ties into Fatima and, and the little Fatima shrine, we kind of call it, we have here. The Jesuits in the United States contributed, obviously, to the educational institutions, whether they were high school or college, you know, the, all these great Jesuit schools. You know, you hear uh, Jesuit educated, Jesuit educated, you hear that all the time. And it really actually also influenced the American Catholic mind deeply. That's a whole nother podcast for another time. And then the Franciscans had the numbers. There were just thousands of Franciscans where there was never more than maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred Dominicans. So the Franciscans had number. And of course, they worked with the poor deeply bread lines, uh, soup kitchens, shelters, still do. The Benedictines had their places and their monasteries in the United States and the different monastic orders. And the Benedictines opened schools and stuff. But the Dominican contribution to the Catholic Church in America at what we were best at, and truth be told, we need to bring a revival of it in our province or in the Dominican order. We still do it, but this will bring us up to our current day, the devotional life. The devotional life of American Catholics was so influenced by the Dominican friars. We started the Holy Name Societies here. That's why it's called the Holy Name Building. So we're the thousands before the Knights of Columbus of these men's groups that would get together and take the Holy Name Pledge, and they would uh, pledge to, to refrain from vulgarity, and they would pledge to go to Mass on Sundays and be good men for their families and keep their Catholic faith. Also, there were elements of patriotism in the pledge. There's still plenty of Holy Name Societies in the United States but they were everywhere. Every parish had a Holy Name Society, and they had to get their charter from here out of the Holy Name building with the Dominican friars. Then on the flip of the coin, uh, for the women in parishes, there were altar rosary societies or, or rosary confraternities. And these would be for the women's and uh, for the women, excuse me, and they would take care of like the altar cloths and, and the, the, the caring for all the different vessels and things at the mass, but also they would have the rosary as their devotional life as well. 
There would be enrollments, and then there would be all these things. Then there was the Dominican laity, which still is going well, going strong, but the lay people who could participate as third order, we call them, or, or tertiaries. And there was also another apostolate for purity and chastity called the Angelic Warfare Confraternity, which was centuries old. And that has actually, that out of the three is making the biggest yes, revival yes. in yeah, our day and age. Well yeah, it's helping, and especially with the ubiquity of illicit material on the internet and in society. And I mean, that's all, that'll be a podcast you'll have to do for the 50th anniversary of Humana Vitae coming up this year. But just how much the sexual revolution has utterly destroyed American society and throughout the world. And we, we haven't admitted it yet. You know, we're beginning to now, thank God. We're beginning to see just what, how off the tracks we've gotten. But we got a long way to go. And the good news is, in the last 10 years, since the advent of the smartphone, where now pornography can be literally, you know, anywhere, anytime, and especially, unfortunately, in the hands of children, our confraternity of people praying for one another through the intercession of St. Thomas Aquinas, called the Angelic Warfare Confraternity, for the promotion, increase, and spread of chastity and purity is growing. And it's growing by the thousands every year. So this devotional life with the rosary and Our Lady of Fatima, so the Dominicans contributed significantly, especially at the turn of the century, up until, I would say, up until the council. And really since the council, the emphasis on the devotional life in the church was kind of poo-pooed, but that's making a comeback now. Case in point, Our Lady of Fatima, when she appeared to the children, she never called herself Our Lady of Fatima. She called herself Our Lady of the Rosary, uh, which is very interesting. And what did she ask to do? She asked for people to pray the Rosary. And I have no doubt in my mind, part of the way that the Iron Curtain fell were the billions of rosaries, maybe dare I even say trillions of rosaries that were offered up to Our Lady over those years, you know. Now, of course, we still have communism in many places in the world, well, in select places, mostly China and the East. So it's not to totally gone from the world yet. Yet, there was an interesting connection. So you had Sister Lucia, one of the visionaries, and now we call them St. Uh, Francisco and St. Jacinta. They were both canonized last year by Pope Francis. There was a Dominican sculptor. We've always had a great love of the arts, the Dominicans, and we've always had great artists, Fra Angelico. Uh, there have been d d playwrights, composers. We've always stayed close to the arts. The Dominicans love the arts and uh, the importance of the arts. And this Dominican sculptor, his name was Father McGlynn, uh, he worked with Sister Lucia. Uh, they were connected when he was in Spain and Portugal. And she, in the 1920s or 30s, directed him on how to carve the very first image of Our Lady of Fatima. And she worked with him and instructed him. And instead of him having artistic freedom, it was the first time he had ever really taken strict guidance from somebody who saw the Blessed Mother, you know. And don't forget, Sister Lucia just died 10, 15 years ago, barely. And not even, I think within the last decade, she passed away. Yeah. I didn't know this was the first image, actually. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. That's true. So that image then, he made a little statue, then he made five prototypes, but then he made a huge, like 25-foot statue out of Italian marble that was carved in Italy by him and his team that was put in the bell tower of the Piazza in Fatima, Portugal now, where the shrine is, the basilica. So there's this huge statue now, we have one of the five prototypes here at St. Vincent Fair. And what we've begun now, since just in the last two years, and this goes back to our foundation. So now we have what's called the Dominican Foundation. And it is, we're mendicants, we're beggars. So it is the arm of our province that asks for money from the good people of God to pay for the formation of friars, to pay for our health care, to pay for some of our needs, flat out. And we also use our devotional life as the means to help make this connection. And we started here now the John Paul II Society. So we actually have at the foot of Our Lady of Fatima statue, one of these early prototypes in the church, a piece of the bloodstained cassock of John Paul II in 1981, May 13th to be exact, when he was shot and the assassin shot three times and all, all the bullets entered his body and they didn't do any permanent damage. And it really, they should have destroyed organs. He should have bled to death. 
And the tradition, he thought that was the assassin, or the, the he'd always said that the assassin shot the bullet and Our Lady directed it, you know. And of course, this Pope had great Marian devotion, you know, the new luminous mysteries and et cetera, et cetera. So we have a relic here. You can come and, and venerate that relic. It's right in the kneeler there. And there's a piece of uh, St. Jacinta's dress. Correct. That, right well, one of the it. dresses she was wearing while Our Lady appeared to her in the, the cova there, they call it, in uh, Portugal. So I came, I came to this mass when the, I think this, I was the mass where the St. John Paul II relic was installed and also just one of the many Fatima anniversary masses that were happening last year. And I thought, boy, I, I, I kind of would like to visit this this shrine like every week. So I decided to start coming here and it ended up, I had moved recently and it, it sort of worked, you know, as far as the location and everything. So yeah, it was great. And also you've got this amazing further connection to Fatima because at, in the statue at the statue at Fatima that, and this is one of the prototypes, right? Correct. That we have here. Yeah. The statue at Fatima has one of the bullets that went into St. John Paul II placed in the crown that's correct yeah they took the shrapnel so then we've got this bloodstained piece of cloth so there's even a closer connection between the two the two places uh, because of that which is yeah. awesome and i think you know i really believe that if and we'll ask the listeners to pray for this you know we need to preach the rosary again it's part of our charism we wear the rosary on our side the tradition is that saint dominic was given the rosary by Mary. You know, there was a great Dominican by the name of Alan de la Roche, who was a blessed, who in the 1500s started the rosary confraternities, permitted them, promoted them all over Europe. And for modern man and our problems, the rosary is so powerful. I mean, it's just, it not only interiorly is it the treadmill of our soul and links us to Mary in heaven and then walks us through the life of the gospels, but then it does great good in the world. And as Christ said, only some demons can be driven out by prayer and fasting. So what greater prayer than the one his mother gave us and the one that even if it takes a while to develop the habit or, or the, the, but the, but it's, we need that. We need organized formal prayer, even though we have personal prayer as well. And the rosary is powerful. And I think even the, a Nigerian bishop said he had a vision of Christ giving him the rosary. There's the awful radical uh, Muslim group by the name of Boko Haram that kidnapped the girls and they terrorize these villages. They're fundamentalists. There was a Nigerian bishop who came out publicly in the last year or two saying that he has a vision of Christ putting a sword out and... It turned into a rosary. Right. Yeah. I read about that. Yeah. And he said that, he said three times Christ said to him in this vision or dream, something, pray the rosary and Boko Haram will be gone, or Boko Haram. I sort of forgive the mispronunciation, but it was linked specifically to the rosary. You know, for all we know right now, if indeed uh, what's happening between North Korea and South Korea is not just show and there's some real movement, maybe there's like 12 North Korean women who are Catholic secretly since the end of the war and they've been praying the rosary. You know, we'll find <laughs> right. this out. But, but Well, that's so, been one of my prayer intentions for the past few months. You know, I started as I've started thinking about that situation more as, you know, the version of nuclear war at the very least. Amen. You know, no, no doubt about it. The liberation of North Korea, ideally. Yeah. So I imagine all of a sudden, if 10 years were now, do you remember the conversion of North Korea? You know, and and I mean, God can we forget that God will work in big ways? You know, we have to ask, and of course, it has to be in, according to His will and plan for the good of all. But the Rosary is a great way to ask big things. And look, the Iron Curtain in Europe did fall, and that was through the Rosary, and that's what Our Lady asked in into those to those children. Yeah, years through, ago. throughout yeah. the history, there's huge mass conversions and. And victories against overwhelming odds because people prayed the rosary, the rosary or due yeah. to Mary's intercession. I just had an episode. Well, it'll be airing this next Tuesday after we two days after Pentecost Sunday when we're recording this with uh, Carrie Gress, who wrote a book called The Marian Option, and that's sort of like the whole point of the book. I mean, she she covers you know the, all the bases on Mary, but a lot of it is about the big world historical picture of Mary's effectiveness in solving these problems that, you know, everybody is trying to come up with, as I said, like in the Catholic intellectual world, people are, you know, wondering about, oh, you know, the role of liberalism and all these different intellectual things to save the West. But it's really like a very simple and right in front of us. It's like pray the rosary. No, yeah. that, that's an excellent point because we do need the goodness of the Catholic mind. And it's suffered. The intellectual life of the church is very strong, and we have more in our history now than ever. But 
it's the heart, you know, that movement of the heart. And what's that? The movement of love. So, yeah, it, it's funny how the Lord uses the small to shame the strong or the weak to, to shame the proud. So here you think like the little old lady praying a rosary in the back of the church, you know, might be keeping the sophisticated secular pagan from slipping into hell at the end of their life, you know, um, who think they have all the answers and know better. So no, absolutely. Uh, that, I'll have to you'll have to keep me posted on that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was hoping you could tell. This is my favorite, one of my favorite Saint Vincent Ferrer stories. The, sing us the ballad of Father Matthew Carroll and uh, the nuns who resumed wearing their habits. Oh yes. Okay. So this is interesting, and actually ties into maybe post council history. And I should say also that he comes from my home parish in Virginia of okay. All Saints. Sure. I didn't know him back then. But yeah, in Manassas. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That actually is a good note to kind of end us on looking to the forward to the future. So as we know, after the Second Vatican Council, the all religious orders were to take a look at their constitutions. They were take to look at their rules. They were look to look at their customs, both men and women and draft up new constitutions and rules in conjunction with uh, canon law, and to go back and look at the early roots of all their foundings, the early saints of their orders and congregations, both men and women, active and contemplative, or you know, tucked away or in the public. Now, fortunately, in many places, which also coincided with the changing current and modern climates of the 19 late 1960s after you know while the Vietnam War was going on some congregations both men and women had people within them that thought that this meant change everything uh, throw the baby out with the bath water it didn't mean just go back to your roots and relook at your early founders desires and hopes and and influence on your charism as where it stood today because there were definitely things in need of reform i think there were definitely congregations that had lost maybe their their joy, their soul, their their core of who they were and what they were meant to be, and just became whatever they had morphed into. I mean, you kind of think of a uh, you see stereotypes, but I mean, there are truth to them of like you know miserable mean nuns, you know, and then to go back to this miserable convent, and you know every, everyone wouldn't be, and then they'd you know take it out on the school kids or something. I mean, that was going on, you know, probably because they weren't happy back at home, you know, and who knows. So anyway, that being said. Many congregations, and this was all approved by Rome and approved by bishops, so it's not illegal. I mean, but they got rid of their distinctive dress. They got rid of distinctive patterns of life, living in communities, so they moved to apartments, traditional roles with terms of title like mother or abbess or were thrown out for president, you know. So all of a sudden they took all these secular influences, and there was a lot of modern psychology that influenced them as well. And unfortunately, membership went out the window. Vocations have dried up to many of these congregations. It's just the truth. Their charisms have dried up. Uh, now, society and the whirlwind we've had in the last 50 years has not helped either. I mean, so it's, it's, been a, it's just been a, almost a perfect storm. But that being said, we actually have, you know, there's, there's always shafts of light and our current congregation, the Dominican Sisters of St. Mary of the Springs Bridgeport, who live inside the church of St. Vincent Ferrer, the convent was built. That was one architectural aspect, that the, and they've been here. They were formed anew uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. To They wanted to go back to some of the traditions even more than the group they had been part of had. Those sisters are called our Sisters of Peace now out in Columbus, Ohio. So they had gone into civilian lay clothes uh, for the better part of the last 30, 40 years, saw that a lot of the congregations of younger sisters that are growing are fully in their habits, they're living together, they're praying together, they're trying to live out that common life. And that's what the young people want. They want authenticity. And they do, my, you know, myself included, I'm in my habit all the time, we, a radicality, you know, to show the world that there's, there is a different way, there's a better way, there's a great way. And then, of course, to lead people to Christ, to Jesus and the Gospels. 
And so some of these sisters who had never worn a habit in their whole entire religious life are now in habit teaching the young girls here at the high school. We'd never had a friar be a full-time teacher in the history of the high school. So Father Matthew Carroll, as you'd mentioned, a Dominican friar ordained about five years a priest now, is teaching high school. And we have had a history in our province of teaching secondary education, not just college. We have Providence College up in Boston. So it's renewal and it's and people see it on the streets. It was also a period too. I'll, I'll share this with you. It's part of our history. It was a custom. So there was nothing wrong with it, but that there was a custom of men. And this just didn't happen in the Dominican order, but many religious wearing of priests wearing clerical shirts. So they looked like diocesan priests and people didn't know they were friars. And for a long time, for uh, dare I say, almost 140 years of our history on the streets, and we were in the churches and in the convent, we wore the habit. Many friars wore the, the blacks, as we say. And it wasn't that it was illegal or it wasn't the frowned upon, but people didn't know well, what's a friar, what's a, you know. And now, it, part of this New York renewal we're going through, our friars are in the habits all the time, in the habits of the hospital. That would have been unthinkable 15 years ago, you know. But people then identify us, like, oh, yeah. And also the Sisters of Life, uh, that new congregation there in our neighborhood here. Uh, working with life in all its stages and its sanctity, mostly with uh, crisis pregnancy and post-abortive women. But they're in the city. So here we are now, a sister and a friar. We meet on a street corner and a bunch of secular Upper East Siders are probably looking, oh, who are they or what are they doing? And and how, how they, hopefully they see our smiles and our laughs. They know we're Catholic. It's neat. It's new evangelization. I saw, I saw a tweet recently there. Somebody said like, I... He basically said, I can't understand why if you had the opportunity to wear medieval robes every day, you would choose not to <laughs> if you had an excuse to, basically. No, it's the easiest uh, uniform, if I may say. Yeah. It's quite comfortable and it's cool in the summer, believe it or not, because it's loose. Yeah. Right. The story I had heard was that Father Matthew Carroll, this young priest, had started teaching at the girls' high school here and the students were also impressed with him wearing his robes every day that the the nuns, uh, the sisters all decided to start doing it too. I don't know if that's an oversimplification or, or- No, but that's probably the genesis of the story. So they probably saw, wow, if he's doing it, maybe we should recapture and reclaim that. And sure enough, they have. But my my other thought is that if, 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 that, if I was him, I would have such a big head but like I was the one who spurred the nuns to start, <laughs> you know, wearing their. I, I keep saying nuns, but I'm not. I, that may be Actually, technically no, no, incorrect. That, that's good for the listeners. Nuns in the church. It's the common term used by everybody. But nuns are cloistered. So Carmelites, Dominicans, you know, a poor Claire's of perpetual adoration. Sisters are active. Right. Yeah. I, I only just sort of learned this distinction and I still haven't quite succeeded in retraining myself to say that. So these are sisters, but. Anyway. That's good. And we'll learn those distinctions, you know. Yes. And and modern man wants to have so many distinctions and proper words and uses <laughs> and pronouns. <laughs> That's right. That uh That's right. let's let's make the distinctions for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank good. you so much, Father John, for coming on the show and, and leading us through this glorious history. Yes. No, and uh, please, if you're in New York and uh, come say hello to us, you know, please find out more about our uh OP East, that's our province's website, opeast.org. Please come say hi, see the beautiful architecture, stop the friars, or God forbid, if you ever had a loved one getting care in any of the hospitals, call us up. We'll go visit them. We'll bring them the sacraments. If it's God's holy will and St. Dominic and Our Lady and all the great saints of the order who've come before us, continue to uh, intercede. We'd love to bear more fruit here uh, in the Big Apple. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. God bless all the listeners. Right, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. This week's excerpt is from St. John Paul II in his Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and it's in the section where he's talking about the problem of suffering. This is the definitive meaning of Good Friday. Man, you who judge God, who order him to justify himself before your tribunal, think about yourself if you are not responsible for the death of this condemned man. 
if the judgment of God is not actually a judgment upon yourself. Consider if this judgment and its result, the cross and then the resurrection, are not your only way to salvation. All right, thanks for listening to the Catholic Culture Podcast, as always. Uh, If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Even more, if you could give us a nice review on iTunes, review and rating, or just a rating if you don't feel like writing out a review. It really helps the show if you do that. I would definitely appreciate it. Also, you can send me feedback at podcast at catholicculture.org, and I will be happy to read it and respond. Next week's episode is on the ethics of money production, and I promise it is a very interesting topic. 